The topic for today's seminar is effective teamwork and why team rules can help. And obviously we're coming at this from a Belvin perspective because uh, this is a Belvin Island webinar. But this is much more than that. This is talking about how we're going to go through building teams. And we mean teams of all sorts. Um, teams of managers, teams of uh, non-profit sectors, and indeed sports teams. Um, so my colleague Bernard will, will run through some of the technical parts about the team later on. And we'll finish by talking a little bit about Belvin. But we will try and focus where we can on something of value, which is building groups into teams. And in thinking about teams, I was thinking of an analogy um, about great teams. And for those of you who are not of a sporting uh, bent, please excuse me. But I think you would have to have been on the moon not to see the, the World Cup. So price. And for the Germans who won again, my colleague Bernard, who hails from France, was particularly disappointed because of the love between France and Germany. But in any event, Germany <laughs> tried yet again. Um, and it was very interesting. People always said it's down to teamwork. And in doing some reading on it, that's exactly what Philippe Lam, the captain of the German team, said. And the quote is self-explanatory. Um, but it is absolutely the case. They may not have been the best players. They may not have had the superstars and the strikers, although they had some good players. It doesn't matter if we have the best players. You have to have the best team. And in a way, I think that's really appropriate to any business challenge that people face. When you look at performance, there are some obvious matters, some facts that everybody's aware of. Um, the skills that somebody has, the qualifications, the technical ability, the experience over many years, and the individual flair. And then there are the not so obvious, but in many ways, equally if not more important, their attitude, their temperament under pressure, their motivation, be it self-motivation or the driving of the team, the teamwork. And it's the combination of both of those that we feel give you a behavior and a performance that really works. Too often, I think, we tend to look at the obvious and we tend to measure the obvious rather than measuring the not so obvious. And sometimes the difference between team success and team failure can be the performance and behavior that comes from the not so obvious side of the house. So with that in mind, we tended to look at um, a lot in our work about team performance. And I'm going to let this settle in for a second and not run through this. Um, Katzenbach and Smith, two strong writers on this area, have talked about the different types of teams that there are. Uh, on the far left, you can see in red what we describe as the working group. And the truth of it is that very many teams, and indeed groups of individuals, fall into this category. They may be operating in their own functions, and perfectly adequately so, but they are a group. And when they come together as a team, they tend to be representative of the functions that put them there. The sales director will always fight for the sales team finance director for the finance team, etc. And that is a group which is not yet climbing up the team performance curve. And realistically, in the work we do, many people are at that, are at that level. You then move into what, what, what the curve describes as the team effectiveness the pseudo team. It looks as if they're acting as a team. So they're going through the motions of together as a team but they're not really making decisions based upon what need the team have. They're just going through the motions. A potential team is someone who, in our opinion, as a group of individuals, believe, okay, we now need to move this on. We want to turn ourselves from a group of individuals into a team. And then through it, you come to the real team. And the definition there is very interesting. A small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, set of goals, and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. So you are moving away from the group through the stages into a real team. Finally, the move to the high performing team. The team is far more important than both the individuals and the functions that they hold. It is, as the German soccer team, 
acting as a team. The individuals play their part, but are prepared to sacrifice themselves sometimes for the greater good of the team. But no, do you have any comments to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the fundamental question to ask ourselves here is why focus on team performance? And when you think about this, no man is an island in, in, the, in the corporate world. And in general, you could say that the results of an organization are a direct consequence of the performance of its teams. Um, meaning that in order to accelerate the results of the organization, these teams must accelerate their performance. And, and from our work in the last, um, I would say, 12 years, um, using the Belden methodology as a diagnostic tool, because it's only a tool, uh, for, and, and within your diagnostic phase, we find that most teams suffer issues that kind of limit their potential and their decision-making ability. Um, a lot of folks, you know, systems think that they're a real or potential teams, but are actually just a working group, working in silos, not really communicating, uh, and more importantly, not understanding their purpose. Purpose is, is coming is, is quite important here. So fundamentally, this presentation is about why focus on team performance using the development methodology. Okay, John? Thanks for that, yeah. So looking at the research on team and just a group, it's very, very interesting. And some research has been done on it with respect to the difference between the two. So again, I'll let that settle for a second. So if you take a look at those categories and, and, and how they come together, um, you can see that whilst the group in theory appears to be fairly cohesive, in fact, often some of these don't apply. Now, they may not all apply. For instance, this does appear to put the group into a position of being fundamentally more revolutionary than the team. But I think if you were to look honestly at the group's uh, section, where you have groups or departments, you often get this kind of tendency to have the silo effect. Um, the team, on the other hand, has certain characteristics. Meredith Belden, when he did his research, said that the ideal team is somewhere between four and six. The team size is limited. The way the team selects is crucial. We'll come back to that. Um, they were doing different roles. Too often a group, it's functionally divided. They're all doing their own thing. This is doing roles that are complementary to each other rather than being different. The management style was consultative. They, were, they had a common purpose, as Bernard said. Decision making was shared, the involvement was total, and there was trust. And that's very, very important. Some other work by, by, by other uh, management leaders, leadership um, uh, behavioral studies have proven that trust is the key issue. There are different viewpoints welcome, and there's shared feedback. So there's a difference again between the two. Any comment on that, Bernard? No, and, and I think um, even when leaders and team members acknowledge these issues, um, they rarely know how to go about improving their team performance. Um, it can be straightforward, quite simple when you look at this slide, um, but there's a lot of underlying work to be done to, to, to move uh, using that hockey stick curve, as I call it, from a, a group of individuals to a team. So that's why I like that slide quite well. Now. Okay. We think that it might be time to change the emphasis. Sometimes in trying to solve an issue, instead of looking at the team themselves, there are many companies that tend to tinker. They will add or they'll add new people. Rather than looking at the emphasis on turning a group into a team. So Bernard, would you meet there, please? Thanks. Um, because simply adding more people to an existing mix can be very difficult. Um, their chemistry comes into play. 
And you tend to have a situation where a group or a company may not know that. We think it's time to look at new rules and use new tools. And one of those um, is Belden. What we're saying is that looking at the team is simply something that needs to be done for the sake of good order. Often we find that a lot of people don't talk to us about the particular techniques we employ, but are inclined to say, why do I need to put money into this teamwork stuff? What's it really going to give me? Right? And the truth is applying new rules and new tools give you that different perspective on what a team is and what you can do. In simple terms, one plus one equals three, because the combination of individuals, the sum of the whole, is going to be the individual parts. If you take a look at team behavior, which I suppose really under, underlies all this, in fact, team behavior is a combination of several things. The first and I the most important thing is the personality of the individuals. And that's something that the Belden rules look at. The individuals and their personalities are absolutely key. Principally, obviously, their mental abilities, their um, attitude towards the, uh, the role, the experiences they've had over a period of time, 20, 15, 30 years, or even 10, they bring different attitudes towards it. What they've learned while they've been in the role is also extremely important because that will tend to point towards performance. Less obvious are the values and motivations they bring in. Um, it, it can be seen sometimes in the not-for-profit sector, for example, where there are clearly different values and those values are shared. If they are shared, that's great, but if they are individual, it can cause conflict. And finally, the constraints and, and, and issues you have with the work and the job. It's all of these together that build a picture of what a team has. And it's only by really analyzing those that you can come to a view. And here I'd like to introduce the development team rules to you. Uh, forgive me if some of you are, will already be very familiar with it, and some of you are completely unfamiliar with it. So I'm going to stretch it towards those who are unfamiliar. But obviously you have the questions if there are uh, opportunities for those who wish to answer. And if I have any, uh, Rory, I'm sure, will let me know. But the team roles first. Of all. Yeah, I, I think, I think John, it's, it's a great time perhaps to, to pause, first of all, if, uh, if anyone has any questions. And to ask, I'm going to ask a simple question here. Um, how many of you have heard of the Belden methodology or are familiar with the Belden tools? Uh, so for that, you can just raise your hand, uh, just give us an ID, and obviously if you have any questions now, now's the time as we are going to introduce this. So a few of you, Porek, Petrina, uh, those of you actually, Dermot, okay, Charlie, the majority of you are familiar with that now, so we're going to go quite fast with this, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Yeah. Thank you for raising your hand. Um, and don't forget to uh, click back on that. So the, the, um, if there's no questions, I'll, I'm just going to move on quickly so we go to the practicality of this. Um, basically, uh, Dr. Meredith Belden defines uh, a team role as a tendency to behave, contribute, and interrelate with others. One of the reasons Synergy has chosen this, this tool um, and correlation with Belden Ireland now, obviously, is that it measures behaviors. Um, so, and any type of work that you're, you're involved, whether it's an external or internal change agent, coach, facilitator, trainer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you can actually measure behaviors. So if any of you folks are in the L&D department here or HR department, that means that you can go up to level three Kirkpatrick, for example, in your uh, evaluation of any type of engagement. So we're measuring how people are behaving, contributing, and interacting with others. Okay, next slide, please. So the first, um, uh, if you can switch slides, John, thank you. Yeah, so the first um, uh, team roles are the action or, or task team roles. So obviously, this would be relevant, for example, and the superior execution or implementation 
uh, or focus drive uh, for the strategy of a company, for example, if you're working at a senior management team level. So what we're looking at here uh, every time we, we roll this out uh, is where is the team is unbalanced because you know the Belden methodology is a theory. It tells you that you need a minimum of nine clusters of behaviors in order to have the most balanced team. Um, so what we kind of look at is where is the team unbalanced here. I think I'm going to stop. Nicola has a question. Let me look here. Let me click on it. Rory, can you see that? Uh, there's a question here. Yeah, uh, that's from. You know, Rory. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, Nicola, uh, if you click on the audio um, tab, if you, can you see it, uh, well, better? Actually, I'll, I'll just take it offline with Nicola. I'll, I'll, I'll reply to her here. Okay. Okay. It's, it's a technology issue. Okay. Um, so. The way I like to see this is, um, and I always had a great uh, uh, laugh with uh, Belden Associates UK, is see this um, as the action team roles or the task team roles as the hands. So we're going to use the body as a metaphor. So you've got basically three of them, uh, the shaper, the implementer, the computer finisher. What I like about the Belden language is the little uh, symbols uh, compared to other methodologies such as Myers-Briggs or, or, or others. Um, so you, there's a very good mental technique to, to memorize what a shaper is and, and what an implementer is. And so the shaper, the symbol is the is the whip, for example. Uh, so we tend to ask, you know, what does the whip represents for you? So it's it's someone who will be contributing interrelating, communicating in a challenging, dynamic, goal-oriented way. It's going to give the direction in the company. And you have uh, within the Belden methodology the pluses and the allowable weakness. In other words, uh, they can be prone to provocation. Uh, 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 and, you know. um, and finishing with the computer finisher, for example, um, the computer finisher tends to finish projects as opposed to start them. So it's like having a, a visual map within your your own mind, if you want to put it this way, as you're looking at the, you know, the way the, a, a team would contribute uh, or interrelate, or looking at the strength of a team or allowable weakness, uh, the computer finishers are great to, uh, in terms of finishing uh, projects. And there are other team roles that are really good at starting projects. We'll come back to that end there. So the computer finisher will look at the little sand or little grain that will uh, um, that's still a bit rusty in, in, the, in the wheel of, of the, uh, the, the team dynamic, if you want to put it this way, that they tend to, to become anxious. And so moving on now to the, the thinking team roles um, and see this, the thinking team roles, as the quality of thinking for a sound strategy. I'm going to use that metaphor at a senior management team level. Uh, so in order to have a sound strategy, uh, you need good quality thinking. You need good quality decision making, uh, you need good uh, analysis of, of the market, and, and these three team roles as defined by the Bellman methodology are the best suited for that, uh, which is the plant uh, where the symbol is a little bit light bulb, uh, so these are the, the wacky, as I call them, uh, team roles in the team, uh, they're creative, um, they think outside of the box, uh, they're up in the cloud, but they don't, they're not really attentive to details, for example, such as the computer finisher, uh, followed by the monitor evaluator, who's a good team role in terms of weighting the pros and the cons of the decision making, uh, but they're mostly introverted, they don't talk a lot, uh, as opposed to being extroverted, uh, uh, and they're finishing with the specialists who are expertise in their, in their narrow uh, field of, of, of um, contribution uh, and their now again, we have to be very careful with behavioral science as we're going through these definitions. I know a lot of you are familiar with the Bellman methodology, but we're not trying to put people into a box. This is not being judgmental. Um, it's only about raising self-conscious awareness uh, within the managers or the executive team uh, or any other types of team, as, as a matter of fact, as John said. Uh, uh, and, there, and not everything is black and white, so you're not 100% plant you will always have different shades uh, in there or mix of, of doing thinking team roles when you come to the analysis of now uh, e Enterprise 7, uh, which is quite in-depth. And, uh, so we're finishing with the social uh, team roles. 
which are good at effective interaction commitment. So that's the lubricant within your, your management team. Again, I like to use the symbols, resource investigators at the, at the telephone so people will go outside of, of, of the team to, to look at the resources. The coordinator, uh, the chef d'orchestre, uh, as we say in French, uh, uh, so it's, it's the musical conductor, if you want to put it this way, and the team worker. The team worker, uh, we're on a Monday morning, is the individual within your team who's going to come over and said, hey, uh, Porg, how was your weekend? Hi, Mary, uh, how was your weekend? What did you do this Saturday? They are the very cooperative, caring uh, folks. But however, um, the allowable weakness always the the, uh, the 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 shadow side of the, of the team, or if you want to put it this way, is that they tend to uh, fear conflict and may not be at ease at um, uh, being directive uh, with individuals. Um, this is in a nutshell, I don't want to spend too much time with this due to the, the familiarity of, of, of the definitions, but that gives you an idea of, of um, how things are, are done. A, a typical example of how we work with this, if you take how any type of task are achieved, um, you can break this into four different um, segments. Okay. First of is what is it we're trying to achieve? So that's the task task definition. Um, whether it's a strategic, you know, a product development, uh, a new sales channel, uh, uh, a new strategic orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that answers the what, and then you have the IDs and the information, which basically states, you know, how we're going to do that. Um, and, and, and what is the process to, to, to move from the what to the how. And then you have the planning, uh, moving that ID forward, and you finish with the following through. And you can actually break this down, next slide please John, uh, with the different team roles that exist here. Um, so for example, the best suited uh, team roles in a task definition would be the shaper uh, and the coordinator. Uh, and their, um, the Belden methodology will tell you that these two team roles have a quote unquote, again it's not me uh, uh, too stereotyping here, but they have a quote unquote leadership connotation, uh, the shaper giving the drive, the direction, and the coordinator being more of a social role, knowing which individual to put first forward uh, was more suited for a specific task as opposed to another one. Once you define the what, you've got then the thinking team roles kicking in, uh, uh, the plant and specialist with the resource investigator going outside of the team to find the, the or you know, that could be cross-functional within the organization, it could be outside of the organization, it could be et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have the team worker um, um, helping the planning and, the, and using the resources, managing the tension, if you want to put it this way. And then you have the following through, finishing with the, as I mentioned early on, with the computer finisher who will uh, be crossing uh, the T's and dotting the I's in terms of the project, uh, uh, putting high standards um, and can be kind of a perfectionist in terms of putting the standards up there. So this is how we kind of break it down and, 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 and our role is to analyze, you know, if there are any gaps in there. Uh, if there are any issues, um, whether it's you know inefficient meetings, uh, whether it's structures and behaviors which prevent innovative ideas from surfacing, um, a lot of the things that we see is in the um, um, social team roles. Um, you have a lot of undiscussables issues within the team. So, you know, as as a change agent, as a facilitator, how do you bring all the undiscussables to the surface? Charlie has this raised. Is hand raised, uh, uh, Rory? No oh, question, maybe. No, it's okay. Uh, right. Charlie, do you have a question there? Uh, I'll, I kind of pause here. Yeah. No, no, sorry, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Um. Wait, Park uh, has one now. Uh, Park, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Okay, you don't have a question. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, John, do you have any comments to this, though? No, I think, thank you, I do, just one quick one. 
I think what, what you're talking about is a group of individuals who, although they can't have been at a different stage, there are... Um, Muted. ...definition is when, when they both put together in concert. It doesn't mean that the shaper only contributes at the beginning. It doesn't mean that the completed finisher only contributes at the end. And it's important to note that. Yes, everybody does contribute at some stage, but it's the dominance. In other words, where their skills are better deployed and better used. And what you can see by looking at this is that sometimes during the, the course of the project, you may feel that you as a team is better at idea definition and say less good at delivery. And if you're looking at that objectively from an external viewpoint, it probably means that the balanced team we talked about, there is a deficiency in terms of having someone who's not as strong as perhaps the ideal team should be. So it's important to keep it that into context. You see, Belbin is much more than a team building tool. And here I'm really addressing people who have had some idea about Belbin in the past and have worked with it to some extent. Um, Belbin has, up until recently, really been seen purely as just that team building tool. You get an opportunity, you find out the psychometric assessments of, your, of the individuals in your team, and you can do something to it. We actually believe Belvin is far more than that. And the first thing it gives is the self-awareness. Your understanding of yourself and how effective you are. And if you're being really honest and feel that you are very strongly in one camp, it means that you have some allowable weaknesses on the other side. And that's very, very important to understand. So when you know the type of individual you are, then you'll be able to work out the particular style that suits you and the particular tasks and issues that you're less well suited. Its obvious first implication is in development of yourself and your career, where you're looking at something where other skills are needed. And in doing so, an honest assessment of yourself may make these are things you need to brush up on. From a team perspective, it's very important in mutual trust and understanding. If you know, if you've gone through the Melbourne methodology and that you know that your team is missing certain characteristics and certain styles and even certain, has certain deficiencies, then you're much more prepared, we find, to be able to try and find a gap and to try and find someone to fill it. The obvious other fact is team selection and development. And in the course of the next year, Belvin Arnold will be spending a lot of time talking to recruitment people within organizations to talk about finding out where Belvin can be deployed before a particular hire. I talked earlier about behavior and performance and the obvious and the non-obvious. It's obvious that somebody has relatively experience in your area, has qualified with a certain degree, and has a certain experience. What might be less obvious is what their personality characteristics are and how they're going to impact on the team. That's the type of practical information that it's really useful to have before a hire is made. And there are tools within the Belvin methodology which can help to do that. Clearly that leads to the next part, which is matching people to the right jobs. Often in an organization, people do a lot of very, very different jobs. In fact, in many large organizations, the view is they should be moved around several departments if they're going to be fast-tracked to management. The truth of the matter is, is not everybody will suit an individual job. It's very difficult to find someone who's a pure generalist. And finding people for the right jobs are very important. Again, it's interesting that the CEO points have come out today. And that's a, that's a fair point. How many people know the right job they want to go to? Or much less, the right course they want to go to? And that's an essential part of what Belvin can give. And for those within the organization, an analysis of the talent that they have at their disposal and how they can use them. Um, we find where people take Belvin to the organization, they have a common language. They understand that, that somebody is a shaper and somebody is a planner and what that means. And that in by able to deploy that, they can decide the best place to drive people, which obviously leads then to the training and development of all managers. And we believe it's very, very important as part of going forward that if the managers know that they have a common language they can use, 
it enables them to see where people can be developed and where perhaps with the best will in the world there's no point in investing more because that's not something they're struggling. I move to the commercial bit, and forgive me for this. As of the 1st of September, Belvin Island will be the legal and sole distributors for Belvin on the island of Ireland, north and south. What we're going to be offering is guidance on how to apply Belvin in real team situations. Secondly, professional practitioner and accreditation training in the methodology. That's both for those who wish to qualify as newly accredited people and those who wish to upgrade their skills. It may be that some of you listening uh, to me have been accredited uh, five or ten years ago and haven't had an update session since. The Belvin has been sitting there in the back of your mind. Or it may be that you're someone who perhaps is a coach or leadership development professional is looking for new skills to add to their toolkit. Well, Belvin Island will, will offer methodology and potentially careers in that area as well. Thirdly, we provide profile reports and technical support to coaches and trainers if they are officially accredited. At the moment in Ireland, every individual who touches the Melbourne organisation has to go to the UK for their assessments and the UK for their profiling and reporting. As of from September the 1st, that's no longer the case and they can be all serviced here from our office in Galway. We have offices in Dublin as well and we'll be looking going forward, subject to demand, at seeing where we can make opportunities open to people throughout the whole country. We're here for advice on plagiarism and upgrade schemes, and I want to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, that. And when I finish the slide, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll uh, have room open for questions. There has been a preponderance of Belbert and other tools available on paper, and there have been a couple of issues with that. Firstly, they are plagiarizing because at the moment they're not official. Some of them, for example, don't include the term specialist, so there are only eight team rules. Uh, as of now, all Melbourne official methodology will be on computer and will be profiled. And those who are currently on paper versions, be they colleges, charities, etc., will be offered the opportunity to upgrade for their education to receive official Melbourne material. Finally, we will also help by guiding team interventions within an organization and consult to them to show the methodology in action. Are there any questions on that at this stage? Hello? I'm muted. Hello, oh, Dermot, you can speak there. No? Hi, John. Hello, Dermot. Hi, John. Yeah. Just yeah, in relation to where the Institute of Leadership and on our masters in healthcare management and in leadership, we would mention Belvin and we've yes. used paper materials in the past and made reference to your documentation. For the future, will will we contact you to organise that documentation again so we have it officially from you? Yes, that's a good point. Uh, I, I, are you RC, the RCSI gentleman? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, I was actually going to contact you once I had seen you, so I'll contact you individually on that particular point. But yes, that's it. Basically, we'll be moving people from the paper to the electronic, which will make the profiling much easier for you. And we'll also be there to help you do that ourselves and potentially act as advice and guidance to you. What we won't be doing, obviously, is uh, in any way getting involved in the way you run your business. That's entirely down to you. But providing advice yeah. on Melbourne and the, and the methodology and the electronic would help. Potentially, there may, I don't know how many in your organization are already accredited, whether it's one or more than one. So, be it advice for people who are already accredited, helping you people accredit if that's something you want to do, and uh, moving people to, to the electronic system. No problem. Okay, that's right. So, I look forward to hearing from you individually. Thanks for that. Thanks for me. No problem. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Or any comments? Or, uh, Sorry, uh, I think Nolene has a question there. Yeah, you've, 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 you've got one more here. Yeah. Hello, Nolene. Mm 
Okay, uh, Nolene, if you're having trouble with your microphone, you can send the question. Uh, if you see the question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, or else in the chat chat tab, you can you can type a message there, and I, I can read it out for you if you want. Okay. No questions. Just, just a the hand was raised. Uh, I'll just see. Uh, Dermot, do you have another question, or was it just the original one? That was the original one, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, no, it's fine. That's no. Okay, no, thanks, Dermot. Thank okay. Yeah, thank you. So, do we have another question, Rory? Uh, no. Okay, John. No, we don't. Okay. Not now. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, fine. Okay, let's just go a little bit through uh, how you go through the professional path to become a Belgian consultant and uh, where it leads to. I, I should also add that uh, uh, Bernard Charlier will uh, work to talk about the coach education points that may be necessary for those of you who are in the existing professional coaching federation uh, areas. But for the moment, I'm just going to talk through the background. Uh, it starts with the Belden theory accreditation that some of you will be familiar with. Um, and that talks about the theory behind um, Belden and practically starts to outline how it would work. Then, depending on the needs that you have, we start with, on the left-hand side of the curve, the team intervention for the training the trainer. And that's practically for people who wish to take the Belden methodology into a part of an organization and train somebody else on it. Often you have, in a large organization, one or two people who are Belden accredited, but trying to accredit five or six hundred people. And even though they can start the accreditation process, they need help with other people within the organization to be able to help. So that's the train the trainer um, issue. The second is analyzing reports and developmental coaching and feedback skills. And that's the really critical part of the development theory in our view. On the one hand, many people understand the nine team roles and roughly where they are in it. But the real gold lies in mining what comes out of the reports and being able to feedback to the individuals in a live career situation. And we're going to look at doing that online because that's where the demand we see is. Either two half day sessions or one full day face to face. I should say obviously all of these are demand related, but we are looking at doing um, sessions in Dublin or Galway and Belfast just as a, as a guidance. And if particular people want more, we can also look at working within a certain company. The third section was recruitment and team selection, and that's really important, which is, again, an idea for recruitment consultants, people involved in HR on the selection side as to how the methodology would be there. To be frank, we could do a webinar in each of these of itself, because the depth that Belvin have invested into it in the last seven years is truly monumental. I mean, I qualified in 2013, and it's already moved on since 2013. If you qualified before 2012 or 2011, then the entire scope of Melbourne has changed. And a lot of people look at it from the perspective of those who joined before that, and it's now a totally different proposition. And then finally, interplace and administering projects. If you're working on behalf of a large organization that wants to build Melbourne, we now have the facility under the new Interplace technology where you can effectively monitor and execute and administer the projects yourself. So we've moved away from a situation in which you need to come to either Belvin or you can for ourselves for everything. So that particularly is something we could look with Dermot at, as he, as he suggested, to where you yourselves become self-administering and all you really need is the occasional assistance from us on technical matter. So if you like the theory, accreditation opens the door. This looks at building the blocks. And then we would then look at helping you on implementation. 
So how the project's going to be implemented. Again, if you're going to, to deliver three or four hundred profiles, how to use them in the organization. That's a project in itself, seeing how it works. And any questions on that? Yeah, we have a question yeah. from Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, you can go ahead. Right. Anybody? Uh, Charlie, yeah, you can, can you hear me there? Yeah. Yes, Charlie. Okay. Uh, just catching, um, going back on something you said there, John, for somebody who done the Belgian accreditation in 2012, is the suggestion to do that again? Is that right? Well, it, it, we can do it a couple of different ways. Again, what we do in this case is that nearly always with everybody who's interested will come and see them and go through their individual needs. That's the first point to say. Um, if you, uh, may, may I ask you a question? When did you do yours, Charlie? Um, just without checking the records, I think it was May 2012. Uh, it was it was well, a long week. Okay. But it, it could be that there's very little you need, and it could be that all we particularly do in that situation is sit down and talk with you and plan, okay, so you have the accreditation. Um, with someone in your position, uh, the kind of questions I would ask, and you don't have to ask them now, <laughs> in, in a public forum is, well, to be honest, great, you have it. Are you using it? Do you need any assistance? Um, very, very candidly, some of the reasons that uh, the UK have uh, awarded distributorships to different countries is that it's simply impossible for them to give a, um, a you know a thorough day-to-day -day support um, from Cambridge. So the point of having somebody in Ireland doing it is that means you have a phone number, there's somebody on hand. But often it's more subtle than that, Charlie. It's a question of saying, okay, I've got this thing, and I'm now I'm in either in the business or I'm in my own coaching and leadership and development business. How can I put it into use? What kind of clients can I go after? Uh, how can you help me to deliver and build those clients? What can I say? What materials can I use? Uh, will, will you help me in approaching them and putting them together? And the answer to all of those is yes, we will. Um, because as far as we are concerned, the more people that use Belvin, there's an obvious build for us because the profile of the reporting tends to come for us. But also, the more people that are using Belvin, the greater the strength of the brand. And that's really what we're about. So it's an individual assessment in each case. And it could be anything from you might need a wee refresher through to what I really want to do is use Belvin to build my business. So uh, in general, it's to provide a support, Charlie. OK. And in, in my case, uh, I'm just giving a bit more information. I've, I've done the course in May 2012. I haven't, I haven't used it. Um, now, when I say I haven't used it, I'm probably continuously thinking about it in, in terms of my work, but in terms of officially using it, no. So right. which, which of the options that you stated would be correct in my, in my case to sort of get that uh, up-to-date? Right, um, okay. Any, any yeah. updates and, you know, I take the point in terms of promoting it and looking for clients and, and where you yeah. can support yeah. me in that regard. Exactly. Uh, may I ask, are you, are you a leadership development professional? Is, it, is this your own business? Is it, are you building a coaching and development business or is it within a company? No, it's, it's, a, it's actually customer service. Uh, I'm running the customer service excellence program, but what, yeah. I'm, what I'm finding more and more often is when you're going into companies and you're, you're, you're dealing with you know, in general terms, their customer service, you're seeing that there's something not working with the team. Um, and I'm very, very conscious that Belbin could be and probably is the fix uh, before we get into to look at the customer service element of it. I'm with you. Okay, right. Yeah, in that case, first of all, I will come and see you in any event. But yeah, there are some actual specific modules on customer service uh, that a lady called Francis is, uh, from the UK is working on with me. Uh, because we have, in fact, identified 10 or 11 industries in Ireland which I think we have a higher preponderance than a lot of other countries. And one of them is customer service um, because we have such a large number either of conventional call centers or, or, or assistance. So A, there's a practical module, which is good news. But B, yeah, what we do in that case is simply look at it and see, well, how would we apply it? And that could range entirely depending on, 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 on where you and I got to, 
to everything from here it is, off you go, through to let's do this together, through to we can build something where Belden is seen as a neutral part and supports your brand and your proposition. And in one or two cases, you know, it could even be as support for a tender if a tender position came in. So it's it's whatever we think it will need to support. Now obviously, you know, how long is a piece of string? It's difficult to know. But but realistically we would be looking to support coaches and development right the way through. So frankly we'll talk about it will come and have a discussion. But the yeah, we could do practically a module for instance on customer services. We could approach skills nets and other people that say, here is Belden and customer service, a particularly base model which we could do everything from introduce to co-present to co-market. So uh, somewhere within there, I think we'll find something to sort you out. Yeah, John, I'm, I'm going to jump in. Um, Charlie, yeah. if, if, if I'm right, uh, in May 2012, uh, Belden actually, I think the following year, maybe I, I don't have the timeline specifically in my mind, but the following year, they changed their normative database, and the whole system upgraded to E Enterprise Seven. So I don't know if you were trained on the latest um, normative database, which is called E Enterprise Seven. So, for example, an individual team role report now is about 16 pages. I mean, it's quite in depth. Um, they really overhaul the whole system. Um, so the first thing that comes to my mind, if you were trained in the previous version of the Belden profiling system is to have a refresher, for example, um, which will give you more uh, in-depth, acute, uh, specific data in order to work on you know, any issues, problems, team performance thing that you have. Huh? Okay. okay. But, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But practically, we'll be in touch in any event in the next couple of days and, uh, and take that forward, Charlie, if that's okay with you. No, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Not a problem. At all. Any other questions? I think we're okay, John, for now. So, um, okay. So, uh, I'm, we're coming towards the end of the sort of formal slides part. Um, let me just talk through a little bit about how we'd work through a team intervention piece. So, uh, it will help Charlie as well, I think, possibly both Charlie and Dermot, so how it would work. Um, we would look at if you had a problem in a team or had a, um, a need to bring something in, what's the contracting objectives to be need? Um, then the team would complete their questionnaires online. And if it would be done online, um, typically that would involve somebody filling in a self perception inventory, or SPI, followed by getting feedback from observers. And once that had been put together, then we would co-create a team workshop, which would take a look at the feedback from the sessions, feedback from the questionnaires, and work on them online. Um, the team workshop would be face-to-face, -face, where you try and really get to the grips of what the team issues are. Um, invariably, this will involve a further form of implementation with support and after a period of time, a review and analysis day. The secondary model is a, a longer team coaching or longer intervention, which is where having looked at the results, you start to think, look, this team needs consistent work, consistent support. And in that situation, you might consider sustained team development to move people from the real team into the high performance team, which will apply Belden and other methodologies to bring people through to the high performing team. It's typically a longer process. It typically takes six months or, or longer, depending on the stage the intervention's at. But that will tell you that what we're trying to do is to build everything from the support one day right through to the very end. Our next accreditation for new Belbon practitioners will be on September the 10th to the 11th in Dublin. And uh, we have some spaces still available on that. You can either contact us at info at Belbon or call me. That's my mobile phone over there. And uh, we'd be delighted to give you further information uh, about that. 
as I said, we'll be hoping to move those to uh, further sections, uh, parts uh, of the country in due course. So that's about it for the presentation. Have you any questions? Bernard, any further comments? Yeah, if there's no questions, um, I just want to, you know, ask the delegates just to, to pause and reflect. Um, how was this quick, you know, 50-minute uh, session for you? What is it you liked, didn't like? Um, you know, what would you like to see more of from us? Just to get some little bit of uh, feedback uh, from the uh, folks. We have a substantial amount of individuals here uh, online. Uh, the Belden name obviously would attract other people. So just to have an understanding of uh, what would you like to see more from Belden Ireland? What is it you like, dislike? So you can either type this in uh, or unmute yourself, raise your hand and we'll unmute it. That Dermot. Uh, Ruri, if you can unmute Dermot. It was a good, a good refresher. I like this. We do quite a lot of uh, blended learning, so I quite like uh, you know, go to meeting. We use it ourselves, which is useful, and it gets you know, you can do something quick and you know, quick on the job, which is great at your desktop. So well done. Um, I look forward to talk to you next week or two regarding our situation. So thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Dermot. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave you. I've got to go off to meet us. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot, Dermot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Any other comments, folks? Comments, questions, remarks? From anyone? Uh, Roy, was there a lady called a code of a question? A while ago that didn't... Uh, sorry, John. I was technical issues, John. I think oh, yeah, that's. The, the, yeah. I think we didn't mention, uh, Ruri. Are we recording this uh, this session here? Yeah, we're we're recording the session. Yeah. So. Hello, Ruri. Are, are we recording this? Yeah. Uh, yeah so everyone will we'll get a, a the, the the recording here as as Ruri is recording it, uh, so you can listen to it uh, and then. Okay, folks, John. Finished? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your week. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, talk to you with talk to you with again. We'll probably be in touch with the, uh, with everybody by email just to see whether each wants to take it. But obviously, you're under no obligation to come back to us. But we very much hope that we'll see you at one of the future webinars. And if you have any questions, just email or uh, give me a call, and we'll take them there. Thank you very much. Thank that you. Bye bye. Bye.